Good morning from Panhandle Outdoors, America's only daily outdoor TV show. Your source for fishing, hunting, and information for folks who enjoy the great outdoors. Now sit back, relax, it's Panhandle Outdoors. Good morning, folks. Welcome to Panhandle Outdoors in Western Chester. I'm glad to hear this morning. First thing I want to do is thank Bill for taking my show yesterday. He and Matt had a great show, enjoyed watching it, but we're back and uh, we're glad to be back. And our weather brought to us by Haney Technical Center at the corner of Baldwin and Highway 77. We're looking at a high today of 71 and a low of 51. That rain is coming in uh, later on today, maybe even tonight. Oh, we do have some rain coming and we'll take a look at the rivers. But the big thing now since uh, I I've looked at the water temperature is going up to 58 degrees, actually 57.6, but it's really going up in the last week or so. Remember, it was like a 53 about two weeks ago. So that's a really good sign right there. We're not going to get excited about it yet, but the water temperature is warming up. River readings brought to us by Sand Hill Seafood up on Highway 77. Good, fresh seafood. I run into them every now and then. They're on the road. They're hauling. I, I can say, I know they got a little truck, and I see Sand Hill Seafood on the side. They're hauling it from the boats up there. So I know uh, it's fresh. Uh, looking at Apple Ice Gold, Blunstown, it's right at eight foot. It's dropping out. Got a good steady drop to it. And the Choctatchee Caraville, if you're looking at it, it's dropping also. Both rivers are peaked out now. The Choctatchee will be affected by the rain tonight, so we may get back up there for the weekend, but it's dropping right now today. The tide chart brought to us by Kent Forest Lawn. We have a low tide at 109 this morning, high tide at 254, right in the middle of the afternoon now. It's a little bit earlier than we've had high tide as of last week or two. Uh, now, let's go ahead and talk about our, our wind direction. It'll be south, southwest at about 10 to 20, and that's what's bringing the rain to us. Let's take a break. We'll be right back with our special guest. Hi, right, welcome back, and welcome to our guest. Uh, you recognize these familiar faces? Captain Rick Corley, Danny Cole. Mm -hmm. yep. Good, Good to have morning. you all this morning. Good Thank to be you. here. Uh, it's always great having these guys on because I tell them sometimes I have guests and they just answer yes or no, but these guys, they can extemporaneously talk. So. <laughs> I do have a speech impediment. I have to stop and breathe about every 30 seconds. <laughs> All right, let's start with you, Rick. We'll, we'll start with the oldest and ugliest. Ah, I'll tell you, okay. I'll start with the oldest. Not, yeah, no, ugliest no, too. Uh, you, anyway. Uh, what have you been up to? Well, I'm now semi-retired. I'm doing strictly marine consulting and expert witness and investigation work now. Uh, let Daniel have the rest of it. He'll tell you about what he's doing in a little bit. But uh, one thing I wanted to mention this morning is uh, the flu season's out. And I asked my daughter how she, she's a nurse down at uh, Select at, at Sacred Heart. How in the world do you keep from getting it? And she says, we, you know, they wear masks. They wash their hands incessantly. And she, the other day, she came by the house and she took, kicked her shoes off at the front door. Because you walk around the hospital, everything goes on the floor, yeah. and so uh, immediately she went to stocking feet in the house, and uh -huh. she says, "I don't, I don't, I don't wear my shoes into the house." Uh, it's and she says, "Yeah, it's it's." Yeah, really I want to reiterate what he just said. We're talking about people washing hands and all over the nurses when they do it, like you said, incessantly. When they do it that much, that tells you something right there about about the flu and, and how to take care of it and all. So that, yep. that's that's great advice. I'll make a comment on that too, uh, because every couple of years I have to renew my first responders uh, credentials. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of the things that was really surprising, the last one uh, that we did, a lot of people think they can get a shot of this uh, hand cleaner and that's it. Yes. It, but they actually say it takes at least 25 to 30 seconds of wet contact for that soap to actually work. That's so, good advice. So uh, be sure and use plenty. Don't do a little drop and, and take your time and good coverage and keep it wet for that time period and that's how it works. So about 25 seconds. Of that's that's, what, they're, that's what they're publishing now. Mm -hmm. that's, that's really important. Yeah, I, I was, heard something the other day that said this dry cold is worse about doing this than the wet cold. Yeah, I saw that too. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah that surprised it, me. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, it ain't no fun. I had it right the first year, but I had had the flu shot, so it was minimized. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but it's it's cruel. Okay, like okay. Now we're gonna. I tell you, what, it's so neat to be in this situation here with Rick uh, turning the business over to Daniel. You you're getting a, a witness, a, a really a, a transition of a company. Uh, you witness it firsthand and all. And Daniel t taking over the company and all. It's just uh, it's really cool. So Daniel, what have you been up to? Well, we've been really busy. Uh, been very, 
just running one end of the world to the other, getting everything covered. You know, Rick left a very big footprint, and filling that in has taken a lot. But uh, it's uh, it's been a great transition. I'm very uh, pleased with how receptive and how uh, kind uh, his constituency has been as yeah. far as accepting me in his place, and yeah. uh, really enjoyed working with him. You know, uh, the marine industry really holds some of the real cream of the crop of, you know. Mm -hmm. Uh, mainstream uh, workforce and uh, we've met a lot of good people and worked for a lot of good people and I've had a lot of repeat business so it's really just enjoyed the opportunity to uh, be in this field and to uh, be able to help so many and and we're willing to help anyone else so uh, there's a little uh, a thing there that if you you have a boat or you need something surveyed please let us know and I'm glad to. I uh, know I got a call from a, a good friend of mine the other day and uh, he saw he seen you on the show, but couldn't remember your name. So I we got y'all connected. So I have we'll, the same problem. <laughs> That's the reason I carry a driver's license. I look at what's why I make sure who I am. Uh, we're gonna uh, what we're gonna do? We got all kinds of stuff to talk about. We're gonna take a quick break. Come, I got some pictures to show you, and then we're gonna. Danny's been doing a little bit of hunting and uh, four wheeling and all kinds of stuff like that, and uh, Rick's been doing some stuff. So we're gonna take a break. I'll be right back. Okay, welcome back. So here we're Daniel and Rick, and we're gonna. We got some pictures we got to get caught up on. I missed yesterday, so we're going to show some uh, some nice bucks that have been taken by some folks here in the Florida Panhandle. And we're looking at this is little Madison Connor, and uh, this is a nice buck. This is Madison's first buck. Now let me say something about Madison. I know the family on both sides and all well. Okay, but she it's in her genetics. She's going to have to be a good hunter because her granddad uh, is Lee Connor. A lot of y'all know Lee, a great outdoorsman, and all, and then her. Uh, that's on her dad's side, but then on her mother's side, her granddad is Roy Groom. That's Ronnie's brother. So that's some good hunting genes right there. And, and uh, Madison, uh, that's a great picture. And here she is with uh, Shepherd Ellisor. They were hunting out there together, and that's a really that's a nice book. And Madison also plays volleyball with my granddaughter, and they have a little travel volleyball team. So sometimes when I'm not here on the show, I'm, I'm following this team here. They're going all over the southeast. and. Uh, I'm missing some fishing trips. I'm going to see some good good girls play volleyball. So good job, Madison Conner. All right, let's move on. This is Drew Benton. Drew was on the show the other day, and uh, this is really cool. He said, Paul Paul got him one. And this is three happy hunters. That's four generations because Drew is taking a picture. Okay, so it's a uh, good job, Drew, and, and the, family, the Benton family. Yeah. I know that was a fun trip right there. And how about old Dwayne, Dwayne Robinson <laughs> right out of Martin Lake? Look at that crop, the biggest crop they ever wow. caught. Good job, Dwayne. Martin Lake. Okay, I got a couple more here. Uh, out of the surf, uh, Bobby wow. Davidson, a good fight. That's a big drum. That is a big drum right there. And you can see uh, a happy boy and release. We talked about those big old drums. No need to keep those fish right there. They're not good to eat. Just catch them, take a picture, and, and let them go. Yep. Nick Borthwick, uh, coach out there at South Walton. It's a beautiful morning. It's God to glory. This is a Holmes County buck. Good job, Nick. That is a nice book right there. Daniel, what do you think about that one? Pretty nice. Nice, nice book. And, and then uh, I've got, uh, let's see, we've got uh, right here, this is Deb Crumnocker sent this. This is her husband, Marty. He was a kayak fishing in St. Joe Bay, yeah. and they're, the, they, they're working there at the uh, St. Joe yeah. Reserve. Uh, and uh, they, they're good out, they travel, they're good outdoors. And good job, Marty. Okay, and I think that's that's it now on pictures and all. We're going to show you another one. But uh, show those hunting pictures that sort of get you all pumped up, don't it? <laughs> yeah. yeah. What have you done this year so far? Well, you know, it's uh, I've been so busy with the transitions from Rick and, you know, retiring you really and me picking up. And, yeah. yeah. So uh, I've got a couple uh, of does, which okay. I'm, I have nothing against does because they they clean easier. They, they're more tender. They taste better, to yeah. me, in my opinion. But... Uh, <laughs> It's not for lack of trying, just that's what I've been yeah. blessed with this year. So I would like to see next year to have a little more time and a little better weather because yeah. this up and down weather, I think, has really pushed our rut off and it's uh, it's really slowed things down even more so. It's where, like, where are some of the areas you hunt? What general area? Uh, I've got a, a member, I'm a membership of a lease up toward uh, Bluntstown and mm -hmm. uh, it's a nice area. Uh -huh. And uh, really, that's where I've focused. We got about a thousand acres, and that's where we focused yeah. on being. So it's, uh, you know, overall, is at least the guys on lease done pretty good, or uh, no? We've all had a down year down this year. year. It's okay. been really uh, strange, but uh, it's 
it just is what it is. That's hunting. That's why they yeah. call it hunting and not killing. Yeah, and you know, I, I show these pictures. You got to remember, these are all the successful hunts. I don't show pictures of all the unsuccessful hunts. It's like you know, like fishing. You know, the, the hot fish. rainy days. And yeah, the... yeah. <laughs> a lot, a lot of people who are just enjoy out enjoying it all. Uh, I, I did enough of that sitting in the cold rain in the military. I don't really <laughs> relish that idea. Rick, speaking of speaking of pictures, I ran across this picture the other day, and the first person I thought about was you. So I'll get back to it. Uh, All right. This is uh, an old picture. Uh, Robert Heiss had it. It's a classic. Yeah. This is before. So tell us this about this picture right here. Well, my dad built that place right there in 1953. Opened on May the 20th, 1954 and called it Tom Rick Motel and Marina and Grand Lagoon Shipyard. Okay, right so let me, between. okay, let's get our bearings down. We're, we're looking at Grand Lagoon and to the right is gonna be Bray, uh, Bay Point to the right, and yep. to the left is Catherine Anderson's. That's correct. Okay, so your dad started that area there uh, in, in the 50s. Yeah, in 54. This, this picture itself, you said to be around the early 70s maybe? About 70, yeah. I, uh, they, uh, like I say, now that is called Lighthouse Marina and Grand Marlin Restaurant, and they have a big boat barn where part of the motel was there. With the, out, that upstairs part is where we lived. Uh, that's upstairs. where I grew up. Uh huh. That's where you it's grew up. up. Yep. How about that? Yep. And uh, that's that's where it all started for me. Was right there in that shipyard. I ran that shipyard uh, from the time I was 16 till I went in the military. You don't realize how many boats were in there, but you can look at the boats and tell if there were, you know, the 60s and 60s boats, the way they were built. Oh, yeah. Hull. Oh, yeah. Well, a lot of wood boats back then. A lot of that wooden hull, right? Yep. Yep. Now, uh, to the right, the top right hand corner, to, that would have been all Bay Point. That's way before Bay yeah, Point. Yeah, and built. to the right here is what they call uh, North Lagoon uh, Yacht Basin, okay. which is uh, uh, Dr. Campbell's uh, place okay. next door. And, uh, okay. Yep. I, I, that was I fun time. ran across that. I said, that's got, I, I didn't know exactly where I would where like you from. to send me a, that copy of that okay. picture. I, I sure yeah. will. I, in fact, I bet you a nickel I took that from the air. You may have. I bet. Because I was flying then, and Dad had me take pictures from the air from time to time. Well, then I'll guarantee you that's where it came from. Yeah. So, I took that picture with Johnny Reaver back in probably, eh, I'm going to say that's 69 to 71, somewhere in that place. Okay. That's, that's cool. And if you have an old picture and all like that, uh, they'll just show up sometimes. It's amazing, uh, you know, the book has a lot of old pictures, but it's amazing how they'll just show up sometimes in people's belongings or something, and, and uh, especially when someone passed away and family starts going through the pictures, and they say, oh my goodness, look at this. Now, speaking of uh, Apalachicola, that's where you're from. Yep. How's everything going toward <clears throat> Apple? You still have family down there. Parents still live down there, they're retired, um, and I guess uh, everything's uh, just doing okay. Dad uh, ran the tugboat for the state, for the Department of Natural Resources, doing the oyster culture program. And ever since they shut the program down, and the state, you know, has kind of done that and did their thing, I, I think that there's been a lot of struggle in down there. Oh, I know. A lot I, of mismanagement. Uh, but yeah. uh, what, uh, I'm going to ask you when we get back what, what your opinion was, but I saw a graph chart the other day, and it showed, you know, the oyster production would have been like this, but then recently it's just boom. The oyster, and There's a reason for that. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Well, why don't we uh, we'll take a break? We're gonna come back and uh, and, and we're gonna add some. I tell you what, let's go and add these names because we've got a. And I got more names to add. I just can't add them all, all at one time. Uh, from Youngstown, talk to Ralph By. Uh, Ralph, good to talk to you. His beautiful wife Pearl, Youngstown. Uh, Angela Berger, uh, Carol Jean Nick Keeling, Bay Panama City Beach, Tre Trevor Campbell, Panama City Beach. Robert Campbell, the Campbell family, Wayne Campbell, and Blake Campbell. Okay. And pretty soon we'll be drawing some uh, names for some fresh seafood. So let's take our break and we'll be right back. Okay, welcome back. Then we're Daniel Cole and Captain Rick Corley. Let's, first thing, let's look at our fishing game times. They brought to us by Blue Water Outrigger down in Port St. Joe. And they're having a Valentine's Day special. You run by there, they've got all kinds of stuff you can buy for your Valentine's, some good outdoor stuff. Our right, time today, 5.36 to 7.36 this morning, and this evening from 5.59 to 7.59. So this morning is going to be some good, good outdoor uh, things going on. Uh, one of the things we're talking about, we, let, we went on break talking about oysters and all. I know you grew up there, your family's from there, and I always love to get an inside uh, 
view or opinion from folks from you know that know the area. Mm -hmm. So tell us your opinion of the oysters. We're going to talk about oysters, then we're going to talk about boats. Okay. <laughs> well, one of the biggest things I saw is just uh, it very much appeared that uh, a lot of support from the state seemed to dwindle, especially after the Deepwater Horizon spill. They were saying that the oil would travel that far and that it would destroy the seabed. And so they started allowing a lot of over harvesting, it seemed for a while, just because it kind of was like a, a do or bust situation. Uh, they really had overplayed their hand. The bay, in my opinion, it totally rejuvenates itself. So uh, they had other pro uh, I know they had other uh, programs in place where uh, they would relay oysters out of bad or contaminated water into fresh, which allowed them to be done better uh, or caught better later. And I think a lot of those programs uh, came to a stop. And uh, I think a lot of the under monitoring uh, on top of the mismanagement, mm -hmm. It's caused a lot of the smaller seed oysters to be used up. Uh, probably not the shell replanting that there was with the program before. And mm -hmm. so a lot of new spats not attaching. Uh, but I honestly believe the more you leave the ecology alone, yeah. the better things will regenerate. That, that bay's been there for <laughs> millions of years ahead of us doing what it does. And it's only dwindled at the hands of man and kind of those authorities. So that's probably my opinion on what's in really true. of things, when you stop and think, <laughs> Some of these people, it's like when I was working with the Navy in the research, people talking about climate change and uh, climate warming and all that. You know, these are people that are uh, well-intentioned, but we it's like if you were giving you a physical, and I gave it in the scheme of things, the, the short time that we've been keeping records of, well, what's going on on the earth mm -hmm. is like me giving you a physical for three seconds and telling you when you're going to die and what's wrong with you. Mm -hmm. and it, it can't be done. Mm -hmm. can't well, be done. You know, one of the things, and I've been a common thread, I've heard everybody I've talked to have said the same thing about that over-harvesting. They said it was sort yep. of a climate like the Wild West. I mean, everybody just went out there and over-harvested and really, and uh, they were, you know, doing it <clears> like you wiped out the buffalo completely. And, and, yeah, it, buffalo would be a good, a good analogy right there. Yep. And it, it just hadn't recovered since then. So, so hopefully uh, we can get it under control. Well, I know. I'd like to say too, you know, if really, if uh, the powers that be would realize what a contribution our seafood oh. uh, fishermen make to the Florida economy, oh, man. and uh, they would look to to see more programs to help these guys, because uh, you know it's really a boomer bust business. Yeah. yeah. Everybody in my family in Appalachia was in the seafood trade. They were either doing really well or, or certain times of year really having it hard right. and better management, those people really are the backbone of what makes Florida a great visitor's destination. Mm -hmm. well, there needs to be more done for them. Yeah. known worldwide. I mean, I everybody, agree. if they ever eat an Appalachian yeah. oyster, and we're talking about they tell you. Yeah, it's worldwide. The best. And you're talking about several generations have been doing it. Yeah, and, yeah. Generation. and not just the yeah. oyster, but even the fisheries. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And, and, and hard work, these guys work hard. I tried oyster one day. That's it. Yeah, <laughs> I ain't doing yeah. that. So we we hope that they, you know can help. We just, they just need help down there. I mean, really do. They really do. They help. need to be appreciated yeah. for how important they are to all yeah. the rest of us who live in this state. I Absolutely, agree. I agree one hundred percent. All right, now let's go to boats and all. Since y'all know a little bit about boats, uh, we're gonna pick your brain. What what are you seeing now? We're working around boats and all. Probably the biggest thing people are neglect on the boat and cause them trouble and all that. What what do you think? Here lately, the biggest thing is their ground system. I know I seem like I harp on every time I come, but I've seen so many boats in the last week that uh, the anodes are shot. Uh, they're way beyond their wastage spot where they're really uh, of value, which once, a, once the anode reaches 60% mass, okay. it's no longer protecting the vessel. So we always say uh, you can't put a time limit on it because you can have good anodes, you can be in a marina and the guy next to you not be protected and his stuff will eat yours up. I thought about that. Yeah. So uh, you need to, you have a good check on them. Once they hit about 75% wastage, you got 75% mass left. It's time to change them. If you don't, you'll start seeing on your seacocks green. You'll start seeing stainless hardware disappear, like steering shafts and connectors, uh, drive shafts. Uh, it can just go through and just eat everything up in a boat. It's all connected. And sometimes it's inside the engine, and you don't even know it. And then when it's too late. Yeah. Uh, the other thing that a lot of people don't realize too is if you get one fellow that, for example, let's say he's from up in Georgia or Tennessee, somewhere inland, and he's got a construction company, and he thinks he's saving <laughs> money, he'll, he'll bring his house electrician down here to put in a bilge pump. Yeah. Well, invariably, you that. the oh, yeah. bilge pump 
you know, in a house, you're just opening and closing a, a, a circuit. So you don't care whether it's on positive or negative lead. Mm -hmm. But on a boat, that's important because a negative has to stay in continuity to protect the boat. If they put the float switch on the negative lead, the only time you've got corrosion protection is when the pump's running. When it cuts off, you've disconnected that whole system. Now you're getting eat up. Uh -huh. And you're causing your neighbors to get eat up. So I saw a boat, uh, a Hatter's, that sank two weeks after it had been surveyed. Wasn't surveyed by me, but it sank two weeks later. And they called me in, and I got looking in the gas says, I checked everything. I said, I'm sure you did. When we started checking the water, we found out why. They had a dead short in the marina, and it was feeding to that boat. It ate the through hull up in two weeks Ooh. and sank the boat. Oh, wow. So wow. It, it can, you know, depending on how much amperage and voltage you got in the water, depends on how fast it works. One of my ABYC manuals actually has a, a fellow installed a brand new bow thruster on a 60 foot yacht and literally within 48 hours, it had been eaten away. 48 hours? Within 48 hours, yes. Yeah, so it's one of the teaching aids they use in the publications to show you how dangerous that really is. Yeah. And, uh, I had a friend that has several boats. Mm -hmm. He has a fleet up. And he called me one night about 10.30. He says, can you come down here? I got a problem. And I went down, and he owns a marina. He's, he's big in the industry here. And uh, got looking at it. And all of the anodes looked like they were in a teapot. And I said, Jesus, we got to disconnect this from shore power. Well, that slowed it down, but it didn't stop. Well, this was an aluminum boat. Mm -hmm. So we had to move it clear down the dock about 100 yards away at the other end of his marina. I went back, checked every boat there, couldn't find the source, was going crazy. Mm -hmm. My dad came down. I called him. He, he was alive back then. He said, call Gulf Power. And it was a leaking transformer coming down the guy oh, wire, okay. going to that boat and making the connection. All right, thank you, Officer. We've got to get out of here. Good stores and uh, wash your hands, uh, help out Appalachia Cold Bay, and check your electricity. That's what we're doing today. Thank you yeah. all. Yep. Have thank a you. great day. Thank you all for watching Pan Am Outdoor. Do something good for your fellow man today. And Happy Valentine's. Thanks for watching America's only daily outdoor TV show, Panhandle Outdoors with Winston Chester, featuring hunting, fishing, and other activities and information to help you enjoy the great outdoors. Join us next time for Panhandle Outdoors.